the Large Magellan and Cloud hosted a supernova in 1987, as I recall. And that was the closest one we've ever seen to date, anyway. And it's going to produce more relatively quickly. So why the high supernova rates in a uh, dwarf galaxy like that? That you know, it depends on the, the star formation rate and the star formation efficiency, really, in whatever star forming region you're you're considering. So if you have if you have many stars of a certain mass being formed, then clearly you will have you will have more um, supernova um, events. As dwarf galaxies come, the Magellanic clouds are not too low mass, and they are also not what we call, or they're you know, not entirely dwarf starburst galaxies, although 30 Doradus, for example, is a starburst region, um, as is N11, which is another fantastic star forming region in, in the large Magellanic cloud. But you know, the reason for, for, these, for these starbursts are, are various. So, you know, some starbursts can be induced by dynamical interactions with, with neighbor galaxies or, or um, you know, nearby systems. Other starbursts are fueled by just the presence of massive amounts of gas. So you know, it really depends on, on the local system that you're considering. Now, what is this star with the accretion disk? What is it destined for? Is this going to, well, of course, supernova, but is this going to uh, fall and collapse into a black hole or a neutron star, or do we just not have enough of a constraint on the mass to, to really know yet? I am, again, I am hesitant because we don't have a full spectroscopic constraint on the mass. If it, if it is, if it is if the mass that we suspect it is, it will, it, it has, it has a stand, stands a fair chance of exploding as, as a supernova. Yes, eventually, but it's still growing now. <laughs> It's still growing, which is interesting in itself because you, you start to wonder, what does a star look like when it first ignites, you know, and questions like that. <laughs> yeah. And what exactly happens and could you even see it because it's probably shrouded in dust and, you know, all those sorts of these sorts of questions. But yes, absolutely. I think what would be poetic is if this if this star someday goes supernova, collapses into a black hole and then rebuilds its accretion disk. <laughs> <It ends up. laughs> well, I mean, you know, that's actually a good point. So, so massive, massive stars rarely are on their own. Massive stars typically have companion stars, right? In the sense that massive stars are usually in a binary system. So unless the binary is kicked out during the supernova event, there's, there's a fair chance that the star, once it has exploded and collapsed into whatever it needs to collapse to, has a companion star from which it can still accrete if you know, the orbital situation allows for that, if they're close enough and together, for example. Is there any evidence for a companion star in the system? No. As far as we know, there is no evidence, but then again, we really would require a much higher spectral resolution to determine whether this is a spectroscopic binary system or not. I see. So that's how you tell you can't really do radial velocity or something like that to see if there's another star in orbit, a red dwarf or whatever, which I would imagine would be really hard to see at that distance, right? Yeah, so the optical data that we have, the, the optical spectroscopic data that we have is from this brilliant instrument, MUSE, I mentioned earlier on the Very Large Telescope. But unfortunately, the spectral resolution is not very high. It, it performs amazingly well because of other features it has. It's an integral field spectrograph, which really is at the forefront of, of instrumentation at the minute. But, but again, yes, it does not allow us to determine whether this is a binary system or not. What is the future of research into this star? Where do you go next? And what's, what, what are the burning questions you're asking now that you know about its existence? What are the burning questions that will drive further research into the star? Yeah, so for example, one of the things that we find with this initial data set, so the combination of optical and radio data, is that the disk itself is quite stable. So we would typically expect a disk in these types of environments to perhaps show some instabilities and start to start fragmenting because of these instabilities. 
However, as far as we can tell, this disk is rather on the stable side. Now, we are limited by spatial and spectral resolution, so we would ideally want to use the near-infrared data, should we, should we get it, to further address that. Is the, stable, the, the stability argument valid only for the outer parts of the disk? And is it perhaps unstable in the inner parts? What does the temperature profile of the disk look like? Because again, we are limited by our spatial resolution and the temperature profile will directly feed into this stability argument. What is the lifetime of the disk, which is what you um, asked earlier, earlier? So these are all things that we would like to know, including, for example, can we put better constraints on the accretion rate and the outflow rate uh, of, of, of the jet, for example? So these are all bits and pieces of information that will allow us to further determine what the evolutionary scenario for it, for the system will look like. Red and blue shifting in this system, looking at the accretion disk and trying to characterize it, is that of any use or is it just not, not really anything that you could get the resolution to try to figure out? In, in other words, can you tell the speed of the material as it goes in or is it just not there? Yeah, so that's that's exactly how we... How we discovered the disk in the first place because we see red and blue shifted molecular line emission coming exactly from where we would expect the disk to be. So so there, there are two molecules that we detect in, in the ALMA spectral setup. Both of these molecules show this red and blue shifted emission, which is classical for a rotating structure of, of this kind. Now, what you can then do is along this profile of red and blue shifted material or emission, you can fit models kinematic models to these profiles to try and figure out what exactly the underlying kinematics look like. Is this a signature of infalling material? Is this a signature of Keplerian rotation or a combination of different kinematics? So because of this red and blue shifted emission line signature, we were able to determine that there is a disk but there is also around the disk envelope of material that is not directly part of the accretion disk, but that is feeding the disk from the outside via infall. So there is an outer envelope onto which material is falling in further in and in eventually gets onto the disk where via Keplerian rotation, it is then redistributed and it spirals in towards the star itself. You know, you have to wonder how early that, that starts in star formation. When that profile of, you know, basically a cloud, then a disk in there, and then the star itself, that's, I'll bet that, I would imagine that that's an actually an early feature that you see in, in star formation regions. It is, yes. Yeah, it is. And, you know, we also see at times we see um, rotating structures around entire clusters of stars that are forming. So so sometimes we see a, a very young cluster of stars inside a one of these cores of giant molecular clouds, and we see rotation around multiple stars at the same time. And then perhaps each one of these stars has its own accretion disk, but there is a rotating envelope of material that surrounds the, the entire star cluster. Interesting, now analogs of this. So you know what this looks like now, and you've got a, a uniquely good example to be able to study, but can you look at other structures and the rest of the Magellan and Cloud or, or the other Magellan and Cloud or the Milky Way and say, that's the same thing going on, it's just more obscure. Is that, are we at that stage yet where we can infer analogs of this system? Yes, absolutely. And that's a very, very important point. Astronomers learn a lot by comparing apples to apples, <laughs> so to speak. And this particular object, we were actually surprised to find that it is almost in all aspects very much like a, 
its counterpart that you would find in the Milky Way. The only distinctive features of it are that it is observable in the optical, so it has emerged from its natal cocoon of material, whereas Milky Way objects of this particular kind would still be deeply embedded, like you say. Um, and the other, the other distinguishing feature is the stability of the disk, which I briefly mentioned earlier. But besides these two facts, it is basically indistinguishable um, from, from Milky Way analogs. So obviously what we would want to do now is find more of these accretion disks, um, perhaps see if we can push it as far as the small Magellanic Cloud, where the environmental conditions are different, again, with respect to the, the large Magellanic Cloud. And we can start to perform these environmental condition studies just by comparing objects that would otherwise be perfect counterparts to each other. Now, are these disks in general going to be different for different star types? Meaning if you see an accreting, you know, very young accreting star like the sun versus a B type giant star, is it going to be a different sort of thing? And do you expect differences, different accretion disks for different stars? Yeah, even even in as massive stars come, the accretion disks can be can be very different. So again, we are limited by the spatial resolution that we can achieve at the distance of the large Magellanic Cloud. But it seems like this this particular disk is fairly large. It's about with an upper limit of six thousand astronomical units in radius. Whilst there are other massive stars, even perhaps more massive than this one, that have disks that are that are smaller in size. Low mass stars can have disks that are as small as a couple of tens of astronomical units. So disk sizes are completely different, but then also disk structures and disk temp temperatures can can be can be very different. You touched upon uh, planets earlier. So we would, for example, expect for an evolved young star of the mass of our sun, for example, to perhaps have a planetary system that is forming in it, if the star itself is forming in an environment that allows for planets to, to be formed. Because obviously, as we, you know, we know that stars form in star clusters. So even if you have a low mass star that potentially can have a protoplanetary disk and form planets, it might be simply too exposed, too close to nearby massive stars that will eventually, again, do this evaporation of the disk. So, so accretion disks can be evaporated by a external photo evaporation, so by nearby other massive stars that shine onto these, these potentially planet-forming disks, or via internal photo evaporation, like um, it is very likely the case with HH1177. And with internal, we mean that the photo evaporation or the evapor evaporation of the disk is being caused by the star itself, not by external stars, by other stars in the surroundings. It's just amazing the amount of variables <laughs> involved with. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, it can be a problem. <laughs> yeah, I think people will be thinking of new ones for centuries. <laughs> Dr. McLeod, thank you for visiting us with us today. And I wish you great luck in this research. And thank you. when you, when you get, get more in the next paper, do come back and we'll discuss it some more. Absolutely. We shall certainly do that. So fingers crossed for a James Webb data for this object. Fingers crossed. Thank you for hosting. Fingers me. crossed. Although I think it would, I think it would be a very fine object for JWST to look into, though. It would, wouldn't just because it? it's, yeah, baby stars. You know, uh, star formation is just amazing. I agree, but I'm biased. <laughs>